Tech Day at Techstar Startup Week date in 2020. Um, we've had a great couple of days uh, so far, and we're excited today to jump into our industry-specific tracks this year. Um, a few quick housekeeping items. We're encouraging everyone to support local small businesses this week. So our friends at our partner sponsor, Downtown Dayton Partnership, have put together a list of restaurants you can find in your app under Buy Local Lunch. So we encourage you to take a look, put your orders in, get them delivered uh, so you can stay with us today. Um, and at the end of the day, don't forget to take the survey and let us know what you liked, what worked, what didn't, uh, and we'll, we'll work to keep improving this uh, in future years. Um, so with no further ado, let's jump into MedTech Day. Uh, thank you, Andy Cothrell, uh, Vice President of the Venture Portfolio at Cornerstone Research Group, and John Lewis, President and CEO of BioOhio, uh, for being this year's volunteer track captains. Andy and John organized today's stellar lineup of sessions and speakers, and we are so, so grateful. Thank you both for your work and your support of Startup Week. And thank you to our title sponsors, without whom none of this would be possible. Uh, this year's title sponsors are Fifth Third Bank, Wright State Applied Research Corporation, and the Entrepreneur Center. Um, so our first session today uh, is Unmet Needs, Opportunities in MedTech. Every year, hundreds of new MedTech innovations enter the market, yet human healthcare is still rife with unmet needs. Uh, so at this point, I'm going to pass it off to Andy to introduce our first speaker today. Thanks, Audrey. Really appreciate it. Good morning, uh, Dayton Entrepreneurial Ecosystem. Very excited to kick off our, our second MedTech Day um, and very happy to have with us uh, this morning Dr. Charles Watson. He's the Chief Medical Information Officer for the Kettering Health Network, uh, and he was instrumental in implementing their electronic medical record system, which was, just to give you an idea of, of, of scope of EMR, a $150 million project across nine hospitals. Uh, prior to uh, his work in medical informatics, he worked as a board certified obstetrician and gynecologist for 25 years and still trains OB-GYN residents. Uh, he served in multiple medical leadership positions. He's been a department chair, medical director of informatics, practice managing partner during his career. Today, he gets to work on improving provider experience with health information technology while improving the quality of care at Kettering Health and preparing the network and its providers for the change in payment, moving from paying for volume to paying for value. Dr. Watson, thanks so much for being with us uh, here this morning. We have some pre-recorded comments uh, from Dr. Watson to kick things off, uh, and then uh, we'll be available for Q&A following the video. Good morning. My name is Chuck Watson, and I'm the Chief Medical Information Officer for Kettering Health Network. <clears throat> Excuse my voice, I just found out I have laryngeal polyps, so it may be a little up and down. Um, I've been in this position now um, for about 16 years, and um, my background is obstetrics and gynecology, and I practice obstetrics and gynecology for approximately 25 years, and then started into health information technology. Um, I started as a medical director at one of our campuses and in 2013 became the chief medical information officer and went full time at this position a year later. When talking to groups about what health information technology entails and this group in particular on how I think it is lacking and how I think it might be improved, um, I think it helps to know that where we came from on the paper medical record, and some people in my generation wish we would go back to that still, but they don't remember having to run down to radiology to get results from an x-ray study, or they don't remember having to go down to the lab because it was delayed getting to the paper chart to get a result on a given patient. They don't remember having to wait on the unit because another provider has the chart and you can't do anything until you get that chart. All of these practices disappeared with the electronic medical record. And the electronic medical record is far from perfect. We are probably still in the Model T era. Model T was a very functional vehicle but it's not like the cars or the Ferraris that are available today. We're working, we're getting there faster than probably the cars did, 
but we've still got a long way to go. I think my number one priority today is how to make the electronic medical record more of a joy to use for the practitioners. It's somewhat generational, but a lot of practitioners still view the EMR as a burden and not an assistance to um, healthcare. And I think my number one goal is how can I make it more of a joy to use? How can I get a higher percentage of providers who are saying no? Not only is it a necessity, but it is a joy to use, and I would never want to go back um, to the old way. And for this group, what could you guys be thinking about that would make the EMR more of a joy to use? And I'm gonna go over a couple things that in my opinion would make it better. Number one, of course, the buzzword today is artificial intelligence. And as it relates to the electronic medical record, I think voice recognition is the number one um, functionality with AI that would improve the provider experience. I think at some point, at least in my lifetime, certainly, you're going to see the disappearance of the keyboard. And I know it sounds very Star Trek-y, but I think we'll be able to give not only our documentation using voice recognition, but we'll be able to give our orders into the EMR with voice recognition. We'll be able to give the software instructions on what we want brought up instead of having to point and click it. A lot of providers want us to decrease the number of clicks. I think with artificial intelligence and voice recognition, we'll do a lot more talking to the computer and giving voice commands to the computer to get us where we want to be within the software. A company called Nuance is probably the leader in this right now. Nuance is the parent company for Dragon. But there is certainly room for other um, entrepreneurs or companies to explore AI utilizing voice recognition. Um, I think that would be go a long way into making it a joy to use. Another point I think is practitioners today are caught in the change in medicine from payment for volume, which is what we were all used to, to payment for value. In other words, we're going to change how we pay providers, not by how many people they're taking care of, but by how well they're taking care of, <clears throat> excuse me, how well they're taking care of a given population. Um, and that's largely what population health is about. The problem with it is, is we're relying on the payers to define what is valuable care. I think we could do better if we let the providers define what is valuable care. Um, but that's kind of another discussion. So what can we do with health information technology to improve the way we care for patients as defined by the payers. I think the big thing is number one, improving documentation that we've kind of gone over, utilizing voice recognition. And number two is improving the way we collate the data we've been collecting in the EMR and reporting on that data. Now practitioners have to go to the analytics department either in their practice or more likely in a hospital system and ask for a given study or report. I think it would be much better for the providers if they could define the parameters of the study and run the report themselves. Not only would it save time, but it would save the interpretation by the analytics people of what the provider is actually looking for. So to get a report run today on a given population takes two or three meetings with an analyst who may or may not have a clinical background just to define the parameters and then another um, 
week or so for them to design the study and then show it to the end user to see if it works. If we could get the EMR to provide the practitioners with the ability to define a study and run it themselves, this would be a huge time saver to providers. At Kettering Health Network, we utilize EPIC um, electronic medical record. And EPIC has introduced a product called Slicer Dicer, which is a very rudimentary, at least at this point, um, provider data reporting tool where they can go in and pick some parameters and then run a report. For instance, if I wanted to know how many people in my um, patient population are on a statin or cholesterol lowering drug, and then the next part would be how many of those people are, how many of the people in my practice are also experiencing muscle aches? Now let's run the third report. How many people on a statin are experiencing muscle aches because it's a known side effect of statin drugs? I think those, if the provider could do that themselves, instead of relying on an analytics department to do it, it would be a huge time saver and a satisfier um, to the providers. I don't have a whole lot of expertise in medical technology as far as what hip is better or how do you build a better PET scan or MRI. What we deal with in informatics is the health information technology. And again, it's so I think the idea of collating data and reporting data easier to the practitioners, either, and that would be the, again, user interface with the software, and number two, um, how do we improve the interface as far as utilizing voice recognition and artificial intelligence to support that voice recognition? I think the other area where artificial intelligence is going to play a big role in health information technology is in predictive analytics, where the software will go in and pull various pieces of data on a given patient and be able to give an accurate prediction as to what's going to happen to that patient. Whether it's a hospitalized patient who has a set of data from lab studies or um, imaging studies or vital signs or observations by nursing staff. And then the software will use all that data from that hospitalization and make a prediction of, this is how likely it is that this patient's going to have a major event in the next 48 hours. Or here's the prediction that this, of the percentage that this, pop, this patient is going to have to go to the intensive care unit. Um, I think that type of predictive analytics is going to be very useful going forward. Um, and it can be for almost every specialty. If I pull the statistics on a given patient undergoing a hip replacement, here is their risk of developing an infection, or here is their risk of having to go to inpatient rehab versus able to be a, versus being able to go home for rehab. So I think predictive analytics is going to be a big. Um, area of study with artificial intelligence in the EMR going forward. We're starting to see some of that on the risk of readmission or the risk of a follow-up emergency room visit. And once we get that risk, then what do we do to um, decrease that percentage of the risk? I think those are the things I see that providers would want to have and that software developers and entrepreneurs should focus a lot of their attention. So let's talk a little bit about the current pandemic and what can health information technology do to improve care um, during this pandemic. 
And let's take the politics out of it and just say from a provider standpoint, what I'm getting requested of is give me data, again, predictive analytics. If I have a patient present to the emergency room and has a positive COVID test, what parameters are going to predict that this patient's going to end up in ICU? Some of them we know um, obesity is a risk factor, age is a risk factor, type one diabetes is a risk factor. But I, we'd really like to see the software bring all those observations in the record and say, you know, this patient could go home with home monitoring or this patient has a high probability of ending up in the intensive care unit and should be admitted to the hospital, even though they don't look that sick at this point in time. Um, I think testing has gotten much better. Um, and to me, testing is by saying better, A, it's faster, and B, it's more accurate. Um, so anything that can do, improve either of those two is a plus. Um, but again, the predictive analytics are gonna come into play as to where are we going to follow this patient. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, we were really worried about running out of ventilators. Can we predict which patients are going to need a ventilator based on the data contained in the EMR? Um, and then we take that not only to that patient, but now let's look at the populations. We're finding in college students from experience, not from predictive analytics, but we're finding they rarely get sick. But what they do do is they bring the infection home to at-risk family members. Um, and at the beginning of the pandemic, we were telling kids, if you test positive, go home and quarantine. Now the better answer is if you test positive, stay on campus and quarantine because we don't want you taking the infection home to an at-risk population, be it your parents, your grandparents, or those with known medical conditions that put them at risk. Um, so again, that predictive analytics, improving testing, um, vaccines is going to require an awful lot of data um, on what is the most effective vaccine. What are the potential side effects of vaccines? Being able to run those reports rapidly because we're already doing a very rapid vaccine development and implementation, which has its own risks. Um, I don't know, if you watch any zombie movie, it always starts with a vaccine gone bad. Yes, it's fiction, but there's a reality of rushing vaccines to market. Um, and again, let's take the politics out of it and look at what are the risks of doing this? Um, and are they acceptable risks or not? And again, I think artificial intelligence can help us with those decisions. I think another area of interest to you guys is going to be the requirements in the uh, 21st Century Care, Cures Act. Care, not to be confused with the CARES Act, which is a COVID related. Um, uh, government initiative, but the Cures Act was actually first signed in 2016 during the Obama administration, but the final rule of law was not signed until March of 2020. And there are two areas in the Cures Act that um, significantly affect um, physicians and patients. The number one is the information blocking portion. And this is where it requires providers to release information to the patients. The Office of the National Coordinator has deemed that the electronic, the data in the electronic medical record belongs to the patient. And therefore, they have the right to that data whenever and as soon as it is available. Um, so we have to improve our method of getting information to the patient. Within EPIC, our EMR, we do have a patient portal, but patients like to download apps where they can utilize the app to get their health information. And we have to be able to respond to those apps. And maybe some of you are app developers 
and you're wondering how could I develop an app that would help patients get the information from the healthcare information technology. And there's a lot of that going on right now. What apps can patients use to obtain the data from the EMR? Epic has developed what they call the App Orchard. And if you develop an app that will take the data from Epic down to the patient, either in their portal or right to their app, you can apply to Epic to have your app approved. And yes, if you get that app approved, it can be quite lucrative if it makes it easy for the patient to download their data out of the EMR. The other thing I think that can be improved is patient portals. Epic has its own patient portals, but there are companies out there developing patient portals and using these apps to bring the data into a standalone patient portal. So I think um, developing applications that bring the data from the EMR to the patient, whether in the um, EMR provided portal or a standalone portal are going to be um, important going forward. The other part of the CARES Act that's going to be um, big for providers going forward is interoperability, meaning Epic and all the other EMRs out there, whether it's Cerner or NextGen or Athena, have to be able to exchange data readily. And that's part of the FHIR, F-H-I-R, um, functionality. And again, it's largely using applications to move the data. Nobody likes to do direct um, interfacing. And if you've done one interface between Epic and say Athena, that's exactly what you've done is one interface. It doesn't connect you to all, all the Epic implementations and all the Athena implementations. It's a point to point interface. And that's what we have to get away from. It's going to have to be able to, providing that interoperability um, with improved technology, and it looks like it's going to be applications that are going to be primarily responsible for that. Um, the CARES Act now goes into effect November 1st, um, where we have to provide a degree of interoperability, and that will, that interoperability requirements will increase as will the information sharing with the patients going forward. So at this point, let's open it up for discussion and talk about some of the ideas you may have and how to pursue those um, or any other questions you may have. Thank you, Dr. Watson. Um, I'm hopping in here real quick because I failed at my housekeeping duties. I forgot to tell you guys how to submit your Q&A. Um, so if you're in the Startup Week app, uh, there's a session that says, um, and a, a feature that says session Q&A. Uh, click on that, click on MedTech Track, um, and we'll be, we'll be collecting any of those questions that you guys have for Dr. Watson there uh, and, and forwarding them uh, onto our, our speakers and panelists today. Um, so session Q&A, MedTech track, drop your questions, and then I'll hop back out of here and Andy, take it away. All right, uh, I think we might have a little bit of a time delay between uh, my system and Dr. Watson's system, so we'll, we'll try to work through that. Um, Audrey will be sending me questions. So I'll, I wanna start Dr. Watson just with a couple of observations uh, and then get your thoughts on it. When, when you talk about the evolution of uh, being able to, to structure reports and inquiries EMR,
so <laughs> this is, it looks like we're on about a 30 second delay with Dr. Watts, but it, it reminds me of when I started out in just, uh, where if you wanted to send a memo to somebody, you hand wrote it and then you sent it to the typing pool and they would type it up and then they would make copies of it on a mimeograph or a photocopier. I, I wasn't around for mimeographs, but that's for the photocopiers. Then you can distribute it. And then it got to the point where I could type it up and print it out and take it over to the photocopier and then it would get distributed. And then it got to the point where I would just type it and it was easy. just go out. Right? And, and that reminds me a little bit of where EMRs at in terms of the ability to, to dive in. Do you see a lot of activity around just that independent ability to get into an EMR and get the data out of an EMR, do something with it? From a health IT standpoint, that seems like sort of a, an area that's full of opportunity. Um, sure. I think the technology will probably get there before the privacy concerns. The big thing is we you can't have direct access to the EMR unless you are a provider or the patient. There are HIPAA rules that say, no, we have to protect the privacy of the patient. Um, so giving someone access to the EMR system is very, um, it's, restrict, it's very highly restricted, um, and I do not foresee that those restrictions are going to be relaxed significantly because the patient's privacy is always going to be paramount. Okay. Good. Well, the, the other analogy that came to mind was back, back when, and, and, and you, you probably thought, when remember when you used to add a piece of hardware to your computer? And you had to like go into your MS DOS operating system and like teach your computer how to recognize that thing. And right. Sometimes it would take several attempts to teach your computer how to talk to this new piece of hardware. And now you just plug it in and go, right? You don't even think about it. Um, do you, do you, how, how long do you think it is till we get that kind of interoperability between all the places where medical data sits today? Um, again, I think it's more the language. There are so many different words in medicine for the same thing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's things like SNOMED where they have tried to standardize the language of, you know, a sore throat is a sore throat is a pharyngeal inflammation. It's a larynx inflammation. It's an infection. There's a lot of different terms for the same thing. Computers aren't good at intuition. Um, so we have to better define the terms in medicine so each system knows what we're talking about and that we're talking about the same thing. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, so that's uh, it's almost like debating the shade of a color, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so there's, if you could, and then it's, oh, this is what, you know, Athena, we use this data field to describe this. And in Epic, we use this data field to describe the same thing. Well, okay, we got to match up those data fields then to match up the data. So, so for someone that's contemplating uh, an innovation in this space, I mean, at the end of the day, we're all in the data business at this point, right? Yes. And every patient, as a patient, I have this historical bolus of data that's sitting there. And in the future, I'll also be generating data real time, right? As we get more and more into the instrumented patient, right? I can I can get digital biomarkers off, off of a, I mean, I can get heart rate and heart rate variability and pulse rate and blood pressure. And, and then let alone the biochemical sensors, you know, I can get my glucose and my lactate and my cortisol, and, right? Where, where, what do we do with all that data? Where did, where did it go? How, did, how do we make it useful? That seems like an area um, that, at this point, as as a physician, do you feel like almost like you're drowning in data but don't have information? How do you how do you see that sort of right. dilemma when, playing out? When I'm talking to the residents, I you know we've had EMR now for ten years, and we've been collecting data for ten years. Now we have to do something meaningful with it, and I think that's where the predictive analytics comes largely into play. We have all this data. 
let's see on statistically what's going to happen to this patient in a given situation and okay. use that statistical analysis to say, yeah, there's a significant risk here. Let's do something before the bad event happens. Right. Yeah. And then the frustrating thing, right, is the data is there. It's just how do you how do you do it? So here's a question that's come in. The interoperability rule by CMS is forcing payers to adopt interoperability measures by 2020, 2021. How has this policy changed your interoperability strategy? Oh, um, it can get very technical on what those teams are doing. Um, how are we going to accept data from disparate systems? How are we going to provide our data? There, um, the fire. Um, is a very loose set of standards on how the data should be passed back and forth. I think that's going to have to be much better defined going forward on the definition of the data for each system, each institution, and everybody agreeing on that definition, um, I think, is the biggest step. Okay. Here's another one. Uh, with an increased shift to home-based care, how is Kettering leveraging technology to support this when the traditional model has been heads in beds? Right. And again, that's going from payment for volume. You know, yeah, we get paid to put patients in the hospital bed. You're absolutely right today. I'm still, in, at least in Dayton, Ohio, not so much so on the coasts, but in Dayton, Ohio, 70% of a physician and hospital income is still based on volume but the providers are kind of stuck. We're preparing for value, which means increasing documentation, which takes time, Take time takes away from my volume. So I hear from physicians all the time, you're making me do this, but the majority of my reimbursement comes from volume, um, but we're preparing for value. How do we keep, you know, it's, it's somewhat schizophrenic. I've sat in meetings where the ER um, administrative leaders say, here's what our ER volume is, and we have to get our ER volume back to where it was before the pandemic. And in the very same meeting, the population health people will stand up and say, here's what we're doing to keep patients out of the emergency room. You know, we're doing more home health care. We're doing more telehealth. Um, so it is, we're stuck and the providers, I feel bad for them because they're the ones who are going through the transition of volume to value. And it is somewhat schizophrenic at times so that we have different parts of the organization trying to keep patients out of the emergency room. And then we have administrators who are saying we have to increase our emergency room volume. Yeah, as you build satellite emergency rooms. Absolutely. The city, right? Yes. <laughs> so, so one of the challenges I think in all of this, and, and an area I'd like to get your thoughts on, on its, uh, on its whether whether innovation can make a big difference. Uh, to me, one of the challenges is everybody can measure volume. Everybody can agree on what volume is, right? You can sit there yeah. with your ticker, and, right? I don't think people agree on what value is. I don't think our oh. ability to measure value is in place. And and what opportunities are there from an entrepreneurial standpoint to help support? the ability to actually define and measure value. Right, and I think I said earlier during the recording, right now we're letting the payers dictate what is value. Um, I don't think that's the best source of truth for what is um, valuable care. What is quality care? Um, I think the provider should be the source of truth. And after the providers, then the patient. Let the patient say what is best for me. But so I think providers and patients before the payers um, should, but right now we're letting the payers define what is quality care. Um, I'd like to see the providers be more of a voice and saying, no, these are the important quality parameters going forward. And it's not only what's high quality for the individual, but what's high quality for the population. 
Right. So what, what are some elements of value? So, you know, for an infectious disease, it's okay. That's maybe a little bit easier. Take my blood sample and the microorganism is gone. Mm-hmm. I got value from, from that care episode. But for a lot of chronic diseases or diseases that also involve uh, aspects of brain health or mental health, um, what, what, what are some elements you think about when you think about how, how do I define what constitutes the provision of value to a patient? Right, and a lot of it goes into preventative care. You know, if you have a given condition, let's use diabetes. What are the things that you can do to improve the care of diabetes? It's not only the day-to-day blood sugar control with insulin or the monitoring um, with the portable monitors that patients wear now, but it's, did they have their yearly foot exam because of the decreased circulation to the extremities? Did they have their yearly eye exam because of the diabetes effects on the retina? Um, What is their overall A1C over time? Because the idea of diabetes is not only treating the day-to-day, it's preventing the complications from a long-term disease that if uncontrolled day-to-day, this is what you're going to see down the road. So, so it would it seem to me, I, I don't want to overgeneralize, right? Um, while there's still plenty of opportunity for actual breakthrough therapies, rather, you know, oncology, chronic disease, there's, there's lots of maladies that, that remain without uh, very effective treatments. It, it seems like the softer target now is extracting value from all that we already have. Right. Uh, and 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 it's it's almost sitting there wait, wait, waiting to be scooped up uh, and, and turned into value. Is that is that a, a fair assessment from your perspective? Yeah, I think we have been collecting data now for 10 years. It's time to do something with it. I think if you get into a much more esoteric discussion of the future of medicine, I firmly believe the future of medicine is in genetics. Um, I think we will get to the point with CRISPR technology, let's say, where now we can go in and recognize the gene that causes a certain condition, Um, Huntington's chorea, for example. In the future, we'll be able to introduce a benign virus that will go in with CRISPR technology, remove that section of genome and replace it that will remove your risk of Huntington's chorea. And I think you'll see more and more of that as we understand and study the genome more. Yes, you're at a, because of your family history and because of your genetic makeup, you're at a 50% chance of developing colon cancer before the age of 70. Okay, let's go in and replace that gene and decrease that risk to under 20%. Um, I think that's where the future is going to, probably not in my lifetime, but I think that's where medicine will end. You'll always have trauma. Um, you'll always have acute episodes of a condition, but the utilizing the genome and replacing, I, I don't want to say defective genes, but the genes that put you at significant risk for a condition and replacing that gene, um, I think will be the ultimate future for medicine. Interesting. And, and that really is consistent with the shift from, from, from the tools to the data, right? Remember, remember the gee whiz part used to be Sanger sequencing, right? Yes. Oh my gosh, I can actually sequence some DNA, a little bit of it. And then it became, oh, I can sequence a lot of DNA. And now I can do a genome for probably a hundred bucks. Um, right. and, and so the emphasis shifts from look what we can do to what do we do with this information? Like right. what, what good is it? What, uh, you know, to your point, uh, with a Huntington's predisposition, okay, is that a single gene? Is that, is it, is, d- does data actually show that it's three genes? You know, are there associated SNPs that if you have this SNP and this, then this, you, you know, what do those algorithms start to look like from a, from a medical treatment protocol perspective? Um, so much opportunity there versus I'm going to develop a, a better piece of hardware. Right. Right. It's going to bring the cost down another 20 percent. You know, we're on that path, like with breast cancer. It starts with family history. Okay, you've got the family history. We'll do the um, BRCA analysis. Oh, yeah, you do have the BRCA2 gene. Um, 
Now, now we do all kinds of preventative measure, measures that in the future will be looked at back on as barbaric. You know, we're doing double mastectomies to prevent breast cancer in patients who are at high risk. I think in the future, it'll go, no, we're just going to remove that risk from your genome. Nice. Great. Here's another question that's come in. Um, what do you think would be the biggest challenge when developing uh, an app to integrate all available EMR data across different healthcare networks? Definitions. Again, definitions. it comes back to definitions. <laughs> and then I would add to that, from my experience, working with Epic. <laughs> yeah. Epic, um, because they are, and you know, I tell people we're in the Model T era, era of EMR. Um, and so there's a lot of work to be done with EMRs, but Epic is probably farther along than anybody. So they tend to close their shop so other people can't take what they're doing. We, 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 we used to call Epic a city state. So like yeah. a little city state up in Wisconsin, they have their own law. Mm -hmm. And if you're, a, if you're a healthcare system, you're kind of stuck. Yeah, I think the, I forget who the coordinator was at the time, but their quote was um, at one of the conferences that interoperability is a problem of epic proportions. The subtlety <laughs> was not lost on anybody. <laughs> I might steal that. That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. So, so there's the there's that. So, I guess that side sort of the mechanics of interoperability, and then you've got sort of the guts of it, which, to your point, was the definitions and and just just waving the HL7 or snowman magic wand over things doesn't doesn't fix the fact that there are different words to describe the same things. Right. And EMRs describe it differently. They use different data fields, which are very close to the same thing, but not exactly. Sure. Uh, and I'm, that's a deliberate uh, right differentiation strategy, uh, but certainly frustrates the, uh, the provider side of the equation. I, I think we're down to our last couple of minutes here. Um, uh, if there's any other questions, now would be the time to, to send them in so that Audrey can text them over to me. Um, otherwise, uh, this has been a terrific discussion. Uh, uh, Dr. Watson, any, anything uh, sort of parting thoughts for our audience who, who may be contemplating an innovation uh, in the medical space? Um, I think from a biological standpoint, genetics, from a technology standpoint, app development, um, and from a data standpoint, predictive analytics. Uh, I, I find the predictive analytics piece fascinating. Part of that's my diagnostics background because mm -hmm. boy, there's a lot, of, a lot of data out there that we, sh we should be able to be smarter with uh, than yes. we are. Absolutely. Very good. Well, I haven't had any additional questions come in uh, and my clock says it's officially time to hand it back over to Audrey. So Dr. Watson, thank you so much for being with us this morning. This was terrific. Uh, and I'm sure it gave our audience a lot to think about. Audrey. Thank you all very much for having me. Yeah, seconding seconding Andy's, uh, Andy's sentiments. Thank you so much, Dr. Watson, for being our uh, kickoff speaker for today's MedTech Track at Startup Week. Um, thanks, Andy, for helping coordinate everything and, and moderating today. Um, so yeah, that'll wrap up our first session. Uh, grab some water. Um, grab a little breakfast if you didn't quite get that before you hopped on to join us this morning. Um, and please come back and join us. Our 10 a.m. session is Finding the Pivot, Customer Discovery versus Market Research. So we'll have a panel talking about uh, things they wish they'd done uh, to figure out who their customers were before they got started or, or things they discovered uh, along the journey that hopefully, hopefully can help you uh, to have a smoother path. So we'll see you back here at 10. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks.